Hi, good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us for tonight's discussion, Queer Genealogies. I'm Paula Kupfer, Managing Editor of Aperture Magazine. For those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, it was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Aperture Foundation today is a multi-platform publisher that engages the photographic community in print, in person, and online. Tonight's program is a part of the Aperture Magazine Live Lecture Series, an extension of the print magazine conceived to activate the discussion and debates from within our pages. We're excited to present the panel tonight directly tied to our current issue. You might ask, why an issue on queer photography? There are many answers, but the most salient one for us is that it's a pressing issue on everyone's mind. As we began to research the idea, we encountered a great deal of historians, curators, and artists whose research and practice are rooted in the ever malleable conception of gender and sexual identity, and who are working, who are invoking the history of queer representation and photography to inform their work. Vince Aletti put it well when he wrote, queer doesn't have a look, a size, a sex. Queer resists boundaries and refuses to be narrowly defined. Our moderator for the evening is Richard Meyer, who contributed one of the framing issues, sorry, one of the framing essays for our issue. Meyer is the Robert and Ruth Halpern Professor in Art History at Stanford University, where he teaches courses on 20th century American art, gender and sexuality studies, art censorship, and the history of photography. He's the author, most recently, of What Was Contemporary Art and with Catherine Lord of the volume Art and Queer Culture. His first book, Outlaw Representation, Censorship and Homosexuality in 20th Century American Art, received the Charles C. Eldridge Prize for Outstanding Scholarship from the Smithsonian American Museum of Art. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so, uh, Richard will introduce the artists in a minute. Um, I want to say our discussion is presented in partnership with Parsons, the New School for Design, and the Vera List Center for Art and Politics as part of the Confounding Expectations program, which aims to generate new conversations surrounding photography. I'd like to thank those who have supported this event, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, in partnership with the City Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as the board and members of Aperture Foundation. As part of a nonprofit platform, the magazine does rely on our readers, so please subscribe. We have a table set up in the back where we're offering a few missing, a few uh, issues. Um, a lot of them have sold out, but also subscriptions at a special rate. And if you subscribe before April 8th, you'll be eligible to enter the 2015 Aperture Summer Open exhibitions which will be curated by Aperture Magazine editor Michael Famigetti. I'd now like to welcome Richard, who will introduce each one of our guests tonight and say a few words about his engagement with queer photography. Thank you. Thanks, Paula, and thanks to the Aperture Foundation. I just wanted to say this is a really beautiful issue. So, I mean, if you don't want to buy it, at least look at it, um, fondle it, finger it. Um, and I, I'm going to say a couple of words about what, how I think about queer photography as a way visually, as well as in spoken form, um, trying to just offer something up that maybe will be of interest to the panelists. I'm then going to introduce the panelists all together, and then um, we'll have a more free form discussion amongst them. And finally, we'll open it up for questions. Um, so what I'm showing, can we make the lights a little darker just so people can see the images better? If not, it's okay. I don't, I mean, or maybe turn them off even. Anyway, um, what you're seeing is a spread from Life magazine from June 25th, 1964, a photograph by a, a man named Bill Epridge um, of a bar, the inside of a bar in San Francisco called The Toolbox, one of the earliest leather bars um, in that city. And this is um, thought to be the first photograph of the inside of a gay bar ever to be in the mass uh, media um, in press, uh, mass circulation press in the United States. And because of this image, which shows these leather men beneath a mural, which was actually painted by a bartender at a bar, a man named Chuck Arnett, who's actually also one of the leather man, men wearing caps in the photograph, posing as a patron, although he was actually the bartender, um, because they're not showing the bar. But anyway, they wanted as many people as possible, which is itself interesting. But um, 
because of this photograph, more so than the article, the article presents homosexuality as this secret world um, that is shadowy and still very deviant, but the photograph suggested other possibilities for collectivity, for sociality, um, for masculinity, and also, I would say, for art, uh, for a kind of gay art. And the photograph is credited by Martin Meeker, um, a gay historian or historian of gay culture, as well as others, with, a, with actually inspiring many people to move to San Francisco, not only men, but, but women too. And I think that's interesting in terms of the idea that photographs don't just reflect reality. Um, sometimes they stage reality, but also they produce um, things. <laughs> they actually have a power. Um, I would say this about visual art in general, but I think as, uh, specifically and especially with photography, that images can move people to do certain things, maybe even to change their lives. Just very briefly, um, in terms of the way in which this image has continued to signify, in 2012, the artist Nayland Blake did a beautiful um, installation, exhibition slash installation at the Yerba Buena Center in San Francisco called Free Love Toolbox. And he recreated, this is a digital print on silk of the mural, which has these ribbons tied to the various men, um, which are then uh, sort of like a maypole. He was thinking of it like a kind of maypole dance or some sort of ritual. And then lastly, I just wanted to show, this is actually an incredible um, uh, photograph by a man named Michael Kelly. The toolbox was demolished in 1975, but the wall that had the mural was, remained standing. Um, some people say for a number of months, some people say for a number of years, some people say for a number of days. But it did remain standing, as we know, because luckily Michael Kelly took this photograph. And I think that that's also interesting in terms of the photograph, the, um, this, the ephemerality, but also the endurance of gay culture, both in reality and um, later, as we see with Nayland in terms of imagination um, and reconstruction. And here I'm showing two beautiful, amazing photographs by this amateur Staten Island, late 19th century photographer, Alice Austin, who often photographed herself and her female friends, sometimes cross-dressed, sometimes embracing in various different forms of um, intimate social contact. Um, and uh, these photographs, and Alice Austin, after these photographs, ended up, um, she never married. She met a woman named Gertrude Tate, a dance instructor. They lived together for 40 years. But um, after Alice Austin's photographs were rediscovered in the 1950s, um, since that time, it's been a problem for um, the history of photography to actually talk about Alice Austin's um, life um, with Gertrude Tate and also her, what we might call her woman identified, <laughs> being a woman identified woman she wouldn't have used the word lesbian. But I think these photographs, again, have been very important to lesbian feminists in the 70s, to historians, and more recently um, as well. This is a piece by the queer photographer Nina Levitt called Submerge for Alice Austin, where what she does is rephotograph this photograph called The Darned Club um, from 1891 and erase part of it. And I love this detail. I don't know if you can make it out. If the lights were a little dark, you might. But actually, you could just make out the dresses, the skirts of the women. Like she has not completely um, ups, uh, uh, um, covered over, uh, whited out uh, the bottom of the photograph. But it's clear that there are all these levels and layers of erasure that you have to work through in order to get back to the, um, the clothes and I think by extension the connection and the bodies of these and the, and the intimacy of these women. Um, and now I'm showing um, a, a, a great photograph by one of our um, participants tonight, Lyle Ashton Harris, and I thought it would be interesting for us to talk about the idea of collaboration, not just in terms of artist collectives, like um, the very important ones that, that Kate Hardy is, is involved in, but also an idea of collaborating with the past and collaborating with history or collaborating with the dead. And so here, Lyle Ashton Harris, I would say, is very much collaborating with the image and, and, and sort of uh, presence um, and, on, and enduring charisma. Um, of Billie Holiday. And on the right, a photograph that appeared on the cover of LTTR, um, um, the, queer les the Queer Feminist Journal, um, in which Emily Royston restages David Wanarovich's series called Rambo in New York. Um, and originally, the series, here you're seeing three of the photographs from that series. In that series, Wanarovich had a friend of his. It's all, they're often mistaken 
for self-portraits. And they're not literally self-portraits in the sense that this is not David Wonorowicz wearing the mask of the fin de siècle poet uh, Arthur Rimbaud, but it is um, his photographs of a friend um, wearing the mask on the piers, on the subway, uh, masturbating, shooting up various kinds of countercultural um, activities. And uh, Kate Hardy, I'm sorry, not Kate Hardy, Emily Royston um, restages this um, in, in her series, The David Wonorowicz Project. And I just wanted to end this little pricey on the gay photograph, or queer photography, with this image from um, the protests against the National Portrait Gallery um, when that institution censored David Wonorowicz's um, film uh, video, uh, Fire in My Belly. Um, and these protesters are actually holding both Rambo and Wonorowicz masks, so both the original mask um, and the, a similar mask to the one that um, Emily Royston used in the protest. And so I kind of wanted, one of the things I wanted us to think about tonight is how queer, is queer photography is necessarily a dialogue, whether intentional or unwitting, with the queer past. And that we are collaborating not only with um, other artists, critics, viewers in the present moment, but with the legacy kind of ghosts and after images um, that, that uh, structure and shape what the contemporary moment can be and, uh, and, and feels like. So with that said, I want to introduce our three um, terrific speakers, and I'll do so, I guess, in order. From Sophie, who's on, the, on your left, left, yeah, next to the empty chair. Sophie Hackett is the Associate Curator um, of Photography at the Art Gallery of Ontario and adjunct faculty in Ryerson University's Master's Program in Film and Photographic Preservation and Collections Management. She has contributed to several Canadian art magazines, international journals, and monographs, and has curated or co-curated um, various exhibitions and public projects at the Art Gallery of Ontario, including Barbara Kruger, untitled, parentheses, it, Songs for the Future, Canadian Industrial Photographs, 1858 to Today, Light My Fire, Some Propositions About Portraits and Photography, What It Means to Be Seen, Photography and Queer Visibility, and Fan the Flames, Queer Positions in Photography. Um, next to her is Lyle Ashton Harris. For more than two decades, Lyle has cultivated a diverse artistic practice ranging across photographic media, collage, installation, and performance. His um, works have been exhibited internationally, including at the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Venice Biennale. And his work has also been acquired by major institutions, including most recently, the Museum of Modern Art. His commissioned um, photography, um, which many of, I'm sure many in the room have seen, as well as his, his artwork, his commissioned uh, work has been featured in the New York Times Magazine and The New Yorker, among other publications. Uh, in 2014, he was awarded the David C. Driscoll Prize by the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. He received uh, his BA from Wesleyan University and an MBA, uh, not an MBA, sorry, an MFA. <laughs> Definitely not an MBA. I was getting BA and MFA. I was conflating them. Anyway, an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts. He currently lives and works in New York City and, in his, and is associate professor at New York University. And finally, next to Lyle is Kate Hardy, spelled K8, um, whose work is included in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Guggenheim Museum, and has been exhibited also internationally, including at the Whitney Biennial, uh, MoMA's PS1, the Tate Modern, and the Kunstlerhaus uh, Alle für Kunst und Medien uh, in Graz, Austria. She is a founding member of the Queer Feminist Journal, an artist collective, LTTR, and the New York-based activist group WAGE, which stands for Working Artists and the Greater Economy, which has been doing amazing work around artists' um, uh, rights and labor and uh, fair wages. Um, Hardy holds degrees from Smith, Smith College and the Graduate School for the Arts at Bard and is an alumna of the Whitney Independent Studies Program. So please join me in welcoming our three <laughs>
I thought that maybe we could just start with, is this on? Yeah. Do you hear me? Oh, and now a slideshow is going to go, it's going to sort of loop, Hello. Hello. which includes images from, I, I believe, from Hello. the issue, some of the images from the issue, and other queer visual pleasures um, for you to, <laughs> for you to um, savor while we're talking. So I thought maybe actually I would just start by asking how, well, how you understand queer photography as a, as a category, and maybe more interesting to me, how it has mattered to you in the work that you do as artists and curators. So, and we're, gonna, we're not gonna go in order down the line or anything, people could speak or not speak since silence and has been an important strategy with them. <laughs> but hopefully you'll say something at some point. Well, I, I think of, should I be talking into this? Are these on? I can't yeah. tell. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think of queer photography as having a performative mm -hmm. element to it. Can you say more about what you mean by performative? It could be that, you know, it's documenting something performative, but just that there is a transformation usually being performed, like, in the taking of the photograph, mm -hmm. somehow. So, because one of the reasons I showed that photograph by Bill Epperidge, of the, I don't think that he intended it to be performative, but in fact it became so. So one of the things I'm interested in is how history or reception, sometimes, especially a kind of queer reception, can change images or objects that maybe weren't intended to be quite as performative as they become. In, in the eyes or in the lives of other, is that bad? Is this one bad? Okay. How you, was that profile and how was it received culturally? I mean, at the time. You know, there had been oh, there had been. <laughs> that wasn't the first yeah. kind of expose. I mean, actually, there were sixty four. Sixty four. There had been ones in in like earlier in the sixties. There had been ones in other magazines. But what's interesting to me, and and the texts are fairly similar, all about arrests and and this life of, of um, on the margins of society and shame. But what's most interesting to me is that the photograph, especially that it was printed across two pages, which I think begins to speak, Kate, to how things keep become performative perhaps, is, well, first of all, how are they seen? What even crosses the threshold of visibility to get seen? And obviously, and this is interesting to me in terms of your commercial work in the New York Times Magazine and the New Yorker, what does it mean to be queer or to try to be queer in those pages if you understand yourself as trying to do that? as opposed to in the art world. But in any event, um, so I think that the appearance of the toolbox in Life magazine was a galvanizing <coughs> image for, a, and as Erin Kate's word, a sort of performative image in that it did something rather than just documented a prior reality. Now I was thinking about that image in relationship to even the depiction of like a gay bar in Steve McQueen's film um, on um, what's the name of the film that came out on? This? It was um, Sex Addiction. What's the name of the film? I think Steve McQueen's film on Sex Addiction that came out a few mm. years ago. Shame. Shame. And how that, how, what a um, atavistic read of, let's say, queer sexuality in the context of, let's say, representation of sexuality, in this case, let's say, um, sex addiction and how he chose a very almost a, a normative reading or a very conservative reading or representation of let's say gay sexuality and actuality and thinking about um, it would have been very because for all of us transgressing for that particular film imagine if having let's say a trans a trans mm -hmm. or a chick with a dick for example we know that most chicks with dicks without a you know without a dick you don't work and while I'm all working whether that's in New York City or Pascara you know or let's say Ostia and it was interesting that how that film for all this transgressiveness how at that particular moment it was it had a very almost very old and cliche mm -hmm. um, representation mm -hmm. that this was the ultimate you know um, bottoming out in terms of him crossing over to queer sexuality. So it made me think about that. For, for some huh. reason, so. But I was, um, 
I just want to thank, you know, it's wonderful to be here. I thank Paula for, the, you know, for including me in the issue. It's really amazing to take part of it. And it's really great. I want to congratulate Richard and Catherine Lord for the extraordinary, you know, book, you know, the um, historical book called Queer, which most of you have seen, I guess, by, published by Fiden, right? Yeah. And, well, I was, um, I actually studied with Catherine at, at CalArts, and it was um, during my time there that I had the great fortune to um, work with Jan Grayson, the Canadian filmmaker, and in that class, and at the time, it was considered to be quite um, one of the early, let's say, queer courses in the context of an art school, and so we were exposed to, let's say, Genet, um, Marlon, Riggs, Marlon Riggs' early work, or Isaac Julian, et cetera, so very much, I don't think, in the article they mentioned the idea that queer, in a way, critiques heteronormativity, and I would, by extension, I think it also critiques homonormativity homo mm -hmm. in actuality, because I think what I'm finding interesting today is that there seems to be a reemergence, particularly among the youth, that they are, now that people can get married, et cetera, there's a critique of that normative notions around, let's say, of middle class, et cetera. So queer almost has, in, in, in addition to a sexual transgression, but also transgressions around notions of community, family, et cetera. And that way, like, you know, Kathy Opie's work in that, she's able to expand the notion of, let's say, what a family could be, let's say, today. And I think queer definitely involves, for me, involves that as well, so. And I think, you know, I mean, one of the, if we think about queer as very broadly about resisting normativity, not just in terms of sexual practice, but let's say resisting other kinds of normativity, um, economic, social, political, um, you know, I've, yeah. right, right, exactly. Um, I, I've always thought, and one of the reasons I wanted to become an art historian was for me, art has always been queer in the sense of being this alternative space for imagining what one's life could be or and what social interaction could be and what creativity could be and i sometimes feel that that's dropping out i mean that as art and photography become ever more and i don't want to just blame the market here but as it becomes ever more credentialized and commercialized and also as the culture becomes i think and queer what we used to call queer culture becomes more norm normalized in terms of marriage and the military and children and um so forth and um that and religion to some extent, um, that we're in danger of losing this sort of both the idea of a queer history of gay and lesbian or people who resist heterosexuality or, or, or just find that they fail at it <laughs> like, or, or just don't ever want it. Um, and also artists as, a, as the idea of both of those, of queers and of artists as pr producing some kind of alternative to the culture. And one of the things I really appreciate about LTTR and also your own work, Kate, is um, I mean, I think all of your work, but all of the people on the panel, but I'll just ask Kate this, is it seems like it's really insistent on like that there isn't sort of a lesbian norm or a, I don't know, like a homo norm that is going to be, or a gender norm that's going to be promulgated in this art. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> is, this, is this working? It's yes. Really weird. Okay. Um, and yet it's going to be very explicitly sexual. And maybe that's why it's not normative as a lesbian or homo image. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about, are you talking about LTTR? Well, or I was my thinking work about or... the work, some of the work that's mm -hmm. in the magazine. Or maybe it's not, ex maybe explicitly sexual is the wrong term, but it seems it refers explicitly to the gender and sex body. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's, you know, and fucks it's with it something. Sometimes that you do as a queer person, like gender is part of your dress and it's something you perform. And so that's, you know, definitely in there. And not even in a, a totally thought through way, but just in what would, you know, how that how it would happen for me. I think one of the, for me, one of the things that's a key part of queer. It's not only in subject matter or even in the making, although it, um, before becoming a curator, I did go to art school, I did study, so I kind of come at it a little bit from a maker's standpoint. But for me, the images that also stand out are the ones that where I could 
that gave me some sense of identification, that gave me the, the ones that I could claim for myself, everything from, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's okay, it's like be everything from a postcard of a, you know, Ouija's photograph of two girls at a bar that's kind of been stuck up, I'm sure, in many dorm rooms around, or uh, I really remember seeing the for, the for the first time the Vanity Fair that had her Brits's photograph of Cindy Crawford and Katie Lang, and it in was just- barber, In the barbershop chair. Right? In the barbershop chair, and it was just like, I kind of almost had a physical sensation, because um, it was playful, it was sexy, it was, you know, a kind of an update of Butch Femme, but kind of winking one, oh. and uh, you kind of, I, I certainly felt at home in the world in a different way by seeing that picture, um, which is different than claiming ones that weren't even made with that very specific purpose in mind. But I think that there's something about that act of just saying, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm this one, I'm taking this one, you know, and I don't care why it was made or how it was made, which really flies in the face of what we're trained as that are, as art historians, because you're supposed to kind of honor the intent and speak about the intent. Um, one of the images flashing around, uh, it's more at the beginning, but is uh, you'll see kind of a wall, um, a wall of image, images tacked up, and that's actually something that uh, Vince Aletti did as part of uh, one of my shows in Toronto in the summer, where he just pulled out everything from you know the back page of the New York Times with an ad to photographs to other things that he had collected over the years and created this a kind of massive 16-foot-long sort of uh, crazily shaped analog cloud. Uh, you know, of queer looking over the last sort of 40 or 50 years, which was kind of wonderful and touching. And the fact that he's kept all these scraps of paper that has kind of torn them out of magazines with care. And I think that the kind of that act of, I wanted to highlight that act of identification as something that was um, very, very queer. We've collected the images around. In the absence of images, we've collected them ourselves. Um, I'm just, I, I forgot to say that Vince Aletti couldn't join us tonight. He was, adver he, he very much wanted to be here, but because of unforeseen circumstances, he couldn't. And maybe before we open it out, I'll just ask you all, I mean, I think this ish, this, this idea that certain images become sort of italicized by particular viewers um, or, or sort of become in, inspired, the idea that you're, as you said, not alone in the world is really important. And I wonder if that's for the artists and photographers, if that's part of what you, are trying to do is create images, whether they're about, I don't know, I think of your Billie Holiday self-portraits as partially, in fact, being about the, pos the, the beauty of drag and of, cro and of, and of cross-identifying, I mean, identifying across genders and also across history. And I think of some of the work, at least some of the work that's in the magazine, Kate, also as producing these images that could, for some viewers, be, offer some other way of imagining gender or pleasure. I mean, I feel like I'm conscious about creating more images and trying to make a larger discussion about what we're looking at, who we're looking at, and how. And so that's in that position series, I really did see like this, I, we need more images from a feminist perspective, from a queer perspective, and because the dialogue, you know, has to continue in that. So it's like, in that way, it's almost like collecting. Your goes to me with the idea of collecting and just, um, yeah, the Kate, production. If you don't mind, if I no, ask please, a question, please. that Kate, one of the things that I find so kind of exciting in your work is you really manage to sort of up the ante on what seem already like pretty radical, wonderful images by Claude, people like Claude Cahoon or even Cindy Sherman. Um, do you want to? Can you? Do you want to say anything about that kind of up? I don't know, upping the ante or how how you want to. Because you're clearly inspired by, but not, it's, it's not a literal anything. It's kind of mm -hmm. new. It's like on steroids or something kind mm -hmm. of forward. Um, and I love that about it. So I don't know if there's anything you want to say about your influences that way. Or I mean, I think, you know, it is, that is a, like a dialogue looking back, you know, especially to someone like Claude Cahoon and to the, feminist production of self-portraits and, um, you know, to kind of uh, being the one who's, uh, you know, in charge of making the own image, your own image that's representing you. And I just, you know, I just felt that, you know, like I have to use this conversation metaphor again, but that it continues and, you know, it doesn't die off you know, in a certain generation. And I, you know, and I felt like that that was part of what I would do is just 
you know, do, you know, from now, from what is happening and how things change. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking about the, um, I think it was the, um, Bruce Weber, who was work I love, um, but the work, the pro, not the profile, but the campaign he did for, I think, the New York Times on trans. And I was, it's curious, I mean, um, I wasn't crazy about the images and stuff. I understand the importance and how, f of the context, et cetera. But I, I mean, get, the back, get, get back to your point before, before, Richard, in terms of, I think queer, or for me at least, it's always a having to like push the next level in terms of even to interrogate that. Because in a way that, it almost became normalized in a way. And I felt like um, I'm more drawn at least today to um, artists who are beginning to like tease it and challenge it from a seal, maybe that not to just appropriate that image, you know what I'm saying, but how does one somehow to infect the image or to somehow to tease at its representational powers, et cetera, and I think the other ways in which to gauge, because I think now everything's become so mainstream, and I, um, I think it's, I mean, I'm interested in the archive of, let's say, how does one somehow draw sort of like a genealogy of where that actually mm -hmm. comes from, and I think that's really essential. Maybe that's what you're saying before, because often it, a lot of things are just taken off of the, the skin, the surface, without actually, and that's what was so important about your book, you know, yours and Catherine's book, just to look at this arc of like clear, queer genealogy going back, you know, to the, you know, to the um, 19th century and the, the work you're doing. And so I think that's important as well, the talk. I mean, I think, that, not that it has to be in a, a overly academic way, but how does one, um, I guess, creatively play with that? You know, for example, there was an article, there was a photograph that I appropriated for Italian news, um, cover. it was a, for Italian newsprint, and it was an image of, Zidane, you know, the infamous soccer player who, um, um, who caused France World Cup, you know, in, two, in 2007, because he headbutted the Italian who had said something about his mama. So, I mean, that, it was an Adidas ad. It was an image of Zidane um, reclining, getting a decalising by this unidentified brown skin model. And I was struck by the queer reading of this ad that was for Adidas. I mean, that ad would never appear in the context of the U.S., but similar to like Manhattan of, you know, of, the, of the young you know, white child in the black breast in, in London and in England, it had a kind of heavy, racy you know, connotations. And I was struck how this one image, this text, if you will, could be both a side of critique in terms of critiquing racialized desire, but also a side of pleasure. So hence the semen, my semen onto the original newsprint. So I think there's a way in which, I mean, I'm all for, let's say, and I love Bruce Webb as, as, as I met him, I like his work a lot, but in terms of like this co-opting of, let's say, now trans is in, I'm interested, I mean, which I'm clearly in support of, but I'm also interested in the people who are, let's say, on 42nd Street or down, let's say, um, where, you know, on 12th Street, I mean, where are those bodies, those people who have been, in a way, pushed away to make room for, like, you know, $3,000 sweaters? And the way but we can celebrate trans in the, in the New York Times, but where are those histories, those people, in a way, who have, in a sense, disappeared? And I think it's sort of our responsibility, you also took my own self, you know, how do you begin to somehow deal with that archive? And I think because... I think there, there is a wealth of vernacular of photography that still needs to, I love the performative for the camera, clear that's something I'm interested in, but I, think from, but I think what's really needed today is to deal with the vernacular, to actually look for those bodies through the vernacular, the documentation, this is pre-selfie, et cetera. So that's something I'm curious about, you know, that constantly, and this is someone who does appear in the New York Times in New Yorker, but I'm always trying to push that edge. So whenever I have shot for a magazine, I remember I was, did a por self-portrait um, for the New York Times. They had to bring down the then head of the, head of the, you know, the magazine. Can they publish this image in the magazine? Because I had put, the image his image is a self-portrait of me. It was five of us, Chuck Close, Marilyn Martyr, Nan Golden were commissioned to do self-portraits in anticipation of the election year. I was in handcuffs, uh, you know, it, it suggested the passion, but it was clearly related to Louima getting Salman, Salman, Sal uh, sodomized by the police. So it was a way that it was, it was charged 
And I'm interested in how do you use those spaces, not to be co-opted, but to make them rethink or re reimagine. I think an editor like Kathy Ryan for the New York Times, a legendary editor, she has always hired interesting people, that's Kathy Opie, et cetera, to push that boundary. So I'm interested in that, using that as opposed to thinking, well, that one has arrived at the mainstream. I think one of the things that's exciting and heartening and you see very clearly in the in the issue is how there's such a range of aesthetic strategies to do to do different things. So we, everything from, you know, uh, A.L. Steiner uh, and which I think kind of talks about, um, I don't know, there's collage and infection and like kind of a viral image in so many ways to someone like Zanelli Muholi who is, is uh, it's just, it's so sort of stunningly simple um, it was kind of wonderfully heartening to see the docu uh, kind of a whatever what we might call here a classically traditional, simply documentary approach, uh, but deployed again with such force um, at a moment when we think that maybe the force of a documentary image is not can't quite reach yeah. us in the same way, and yet with the right subject and the right context and the right person behind it, um, you I think that changes um, entirely, and it has us rethink. And she talked about I write about Joan Byron and her slideshows mm -hmm. in the magazine, but she but. And I didn't know this until uh, much later, but that Zanelli had known knows Joan and is actually going to visit and stay with Joan <laughs> next month in Washington D.C. Um, but I, I want to just so can I say one follow-up. So yeah, yeah. As far sure. as Zanelli, I completely agree with what you're saying. I mean, even and what makes those photographs and that that archive so important, and just imagine that a lot of these women, a lot of them were killed, or women or men, and the fact that their last song that may have been singing on the way from the bar is put a, a ring on him by, uh, by um, Beyonce and just imagine, because I think in a way we don't understand how radical that work is in a country where there's curative, curative rape, et cetera, and the fact that one of those women or men or trans could have been killed easily singing a pop song like put a ring on it, you know, and I think it's important to talk about that that it's the photographs, but in terms of what they're actually addressing and what type of um, resistance they're marshalling up, so. So maybe that, that makes sense um, as, a, as a place to open things up to the audience. Um, I, since we're talking about the importance of reception and <laughs> like different kinds of viewing and audiences, I, I thought I don't want to leave the audience out, as it were. So, um, and I just, and maybe one prompt, um, in addition to everything that's been said, is, is just to re rehearse again something that Kate said about that the dialogue is ongoing. And I think something that's important is, you know, I always get a little bit irritated when people say, well, feminism is over and queer is over, and as though these things can be dated since actually obviously sexism is not over and homophobia yeah. is not over. I mean, and we know this if we and think globally or we think the economist, class, the like, issue on queer, queer sexual, queerness, you know, whether that's Russia or Uganda, the fact that right. we have to also talk about the notions of geography, Absolutely. place, right. location, etc. We et can't just think about yeah. what popular culture in the U.S. or or rights in the U.S. as yeah. being uh, symptomatic of. Well, it's provincial the world. to some degree. But I also yeah. think, in terms of photographic strategies, like the idea that documentary is over, I, I mean, is is equally problematic to me because, if depending on what the context is, documentary may be essential, even with all of the problems around truth and 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 sort of you know. Um, authenticity that it brings with it. So hopefully that's somewhat relevant to somebody's question in the audience. And I know no one likes to be the first, but someone just do it. <laughs> Please. And it's an intimate audience. I think it would be great to have names and who you are. I think that would oh, be okay. important. What do you mean by intimate? Well, I mean, well, I, mean, I was in a this panel like a for... This is a big it. audience for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative. But you know, well, all time I'm saying, maybe people can say their names yeah. and who they are so we can actually... And we'll give you a microphone. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, thank you. You, you should self-identify. My name is Lloyd Ziff. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd Ziff, I'm a photographer, former art director. I get the impression, which I'm not sure that you'd want to give totally, you guys, that, that um, oppression, like you were just talking about uh, Eastern Europe and, and Africa, may be necessary to to create queer art. And I don't think you really want to say that, but I'm getting that impression. But, um, but then, so I'm asking, is that so? Or do you feel that, you guys, all of you? 
I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah, I'll just say that. And how do you define oppression? In your life? Well, you just did. I mean, I mean, oppression could be racial, it could be sexual, it could be class. Even thinking about, yeah, are you from, where are you from New York or where are you from? Uh, I'm from New York. Yeah, so you know, as I was mentioning before, the trannies that were, let's say, on 12th Street, <coughs> yeah. that was class warfare, warfare that alienated and annihilated huge swaths of people. If you think about the demographics of this room right now, or let's say a club today versus let's say 10 years ago, 25 years, that's a form of oppression. So I think we need to. There's multiple. Oh, sorry. He's talking to the mic. Yes, I'm saying the multiple notions, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it for me. It's not based on that, but I think it's one of the ingredients, you know, um, as well but as... Is it necessary? That's like just what I'm asking. Well, I mean, how do we escape it? I mean, how do you, I mean what, what utopian model are you suggesting you're thinking about that? I mean, I'm just curious. Um, I mean, cause whether in Paris or Provincetown or wherever, I'm, what, you know, and I, all of us run the gamut in multiple places, we can come up against, you know, different notions of resistance, or et cetera, so... What do you think? No, I agree. I mean, I, I but I, I never, I never, f myself, as a gay Jewish older man, don't feel particularly oppressed. But I understand, you know, I had to get to this point in my life where I, where, where I feel that way. Mm. I don't think it's necessarily oppression, I think, but I, I think that in the absence of images, we create them, right? And we always have, and so we continue to do that. In the absence of a record of black lesbians in South Africa, Zanelli Moholy created right. that. Uh, and in the absence of images, uh, you know, as I came out, I found them elsewhere and collected them in my mind, first of all, and then kind of collected them through in other ways. Well, um, well, so. Peace writes exactly what you're saying, and I totally identify that. I'm probably around the same age as him, and that's exactly, yeah, I saw that when I was 13 and went, shh. Right, and, and I heard that we bought a group of his physique magazines for the show, and we heard that over and over again from men of a certain age that this was the first, this was kind of ground zero for them in terms of recognizing yeah. themselves. Um, the uh, what else was I going to say about that? Which was, you know, in a visual culture, in a, in a very visual culture just, such as the one we live in, live in, an image, an image is power, right? So I think in creating that visual record, we kind of empower ourselves. I just wanted to say one postscript, which is one of the things when you ask that question about oppression and I look at this slideshow or I think about the images I showed, I think what's really interesting is that you don't actually see, I mean, these are so much more about pleasure and difference yeah. as actually a kind of um, self-possession or empowerment. And I think that, that that doesn't mean there isn't oppression. I think sometimes one creates images of pleasure and empowerment in the face yeah. of, but it doesn't seem to me to be about perhaps an older notion of, of of gay and lesbian photography, which is look how hard, look how look how bad we have it, or yeah. much less Life Magazine's image of life, which isn't gay photography, but photography of homosexuals, which is meant to be about about deviance and social marginalization. And I just think it's interesting that these images that we're seeing are so much, at least on the face of it, not sort of well, trafficking in oppression. I, I agree. That's why I sort of yeah. asked that question. <laughs> So other questions, yes. I guess maybe there should be a microphone. Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Tertell, I'm a writer. And I'm curious about how, <laughs> hang on. Um, how far back do any of you see queer art um, happening? Um, how far back do you see ancestors in terms of artists that you consider to be queer artists? Um, because as this is sort of a follow-up to his question, because my, f my immediate thought was, um, well, only in something that we might define as a mutually, universally satisfying utopia would, be th would there be no need for queer art. Um, so there'd be some need for queer art at any stage in history you want to examine. I want to know if any of you have thought about that in terms of how far back you go in terms of looking for antecedents to the queer art that started emerging in the 19th and 20th centuries. I mean, in the in the Caravaggio book, for me, yeah, I mean, Da Vinci. I mean, what? Yeah. But what yeah. I would say about that, or, go, or in this Bessie book, we Smith. talk about Baron von Gloden, yeah. this 19, late 19th century um, Prussian aristocratic photographer who went to Sicily to photograph these boys, young young, young men and boys, um, in sort of vaguely um, classical classical surrounds and togas and so forth. And for him, I mean, it wasn't actually the reality of ancient Rome or Greece, but it was a fantasy. 
about the classical. And I guess for me, I'm more interested. I, I don't want to make this argument that necessarily Caravaggio, although I think certainly we have a history of homosexuality, of, of sexual acts between men and between women, that I would say is, is, is go throughout history and, and is cross-cultural. But in terms of the queer, to me what's more interesting about, or what I think is more useful is thinking about how, again, in terms of reception, artists and others use the possibilities, uh, let's say, presented by a homoerotic image, whether it's a Renaissance image or, or a Baroque image, a painting, or um, a, to activate a queer possibility in their present moment. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to make a claim that there's sort of some queer culture that goes throughout all time and cult, you know, in history and places, but rather that we could think about that anything is possible to recycle and, as it were, queer, or or reactivate in a different way. That that would be one answer. Well, for me. I actually wanted to go back to just to, to well to a thing that you said, Richard, about um, well the images that are up here seem kind of are more playful or more joyful, and um, that perhaps they don't kind of signify a certain oppression or don't experience the sort of. But I actually think they're created in a context uh, in um, against that feeling in la and actually you know if we think about early pictures of Christopher Street Day per liberation parades you know the, they were nonviolent and they were also just here I am literally gaily walking down the street and to sort of uh, you know skip down the street or I don't know wear a lay or be in drag or any of those things that kind of that um, humor and cheekiness was was in fact the the and how that's recorded in images is I think the radical Bit. That is the the kind of yes, you've put me down uh, all through all through my life, and I'm going to show you that that has not killed me. And those images, though they seem kind of joyful and just like yeah. oh yeah, here's another gay pride parade, actually are images of resistance, of a kind of quiet resistance. So I think uh, that's not we, you know, we can't forget that, particularly in those early '70s images. I think are a kind of bacchanalian, you know, 2014 image is a kind of different thing. But I think for sh for sure in the '70s it was Absolutely. a a deliberate political act. Hi, my name is Steven Frankel. I used to be an editor at various art magazines, and I did some writing, and I like to take photographs. Here's my question. I think, Richard, you said that there's no identifiable queer style uh, in your introduction. That's I don't just know if I said that, but I would, but I would agree yeah, with that. Yeah, something like that. But I think that uh, we all carry around a queer filter that basically enables us to know it when we see it, so that as we go through the world, as we look at images, we curate basically uh, an encyclopedia of those images the way Vince Letty put them up on the wall. And I, for one, did something similar to what he's done, and those images are lying around in my apartment somewhere in a box. So is there a gay style or queer style? Well, I, I think I would maybe say a gay reading, maybe. Yeah, yeah, as opposed, I, mean, yeah. I think that gay as reading, one, yeah. you know, as you go through, yes, I think everyone may have their or, or queer identified viewers or, or it's a, you know, may have their own filter, as you put it, but those filters are not necessarily um, fixed sh or shared, yeah. you know. So I think, I mean, when I see, well, I recently saw A.L. A. L. Steiner's film, I'm now going to forget the name of it Community Action Center. Community Action Center. Center. And, and I, A.K. Burns. Sorry? And A.K. A.K. Burns. Burns? Yeah. So I realized, like, okay, I'm queer. How I, I can't be more, I thought I couldn't be more queer than I am. I'm out, and I write on queer culture. And when I saw that film, I was like, well, this is a whole other level. I mean, like, this is not in my queer, whatever you called it, like container or <laughs> my queer curated, you know. I, I, and I actually thought, like, wow, this, this level of, of explicit sort of polymorphous perversity it's, it, it is, it was just, I hadn't imagined it in those terms it's before. Film? It's called Community Action Center, and it's by A.L. Burns and, and um, A.L., no, sorry. A.L. Steiner and A.K. Burns. A.K. Burns and A.L. Steiner. Well, it's not to say that there's any one right, style. Right, right. There are a multitude of yes. styles. So let me ask you a question about those box of images. I mean, have you activated, I mean, what, what is your relationship to them? When I looked at that wall, I thought of them. Uh, fashion pictures torn from New York Times Magazine. You know, like they used to have those fashion issues and I would look through it and I would pull out the ones that appealed to me, that spoke to me. I mean, I, I understand I, and I appreciate that. If we could delve a little further, <laughs> I mean, did you, 
were any of them, I say, um, source of a, a, an erotic fantasy? I mean, I'm wondering, how did you as how did you activate? How did you engage? I think that's interesting. How did queer, gays and lesbians, trans relate to popular cultural images, and how did they make them their own? How did you possess those images? I and I didn't get talk I, since I, it isn't. Well, it's not an intimate crowd, as you yeah. said, but it's somewhat intimate. I'm wondering because I think all of us have our own way of how we engage with those right. images. I how do we to something speak back? You said. It, they gave me pleasure just to see them and to know that they were in the public eye. And it gave me a little bit of pleasure to, in a sense, collect them. I think it's as simple okay. as that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, right. So another question? Yes. Oh. Are you, you're going to ask the question. OK. Hi, <laughs> I'm Taya. Um, I actually and the work scholar for Aperture Magazine. So what for Aperture Magazine, the work scholar. So I've probably emailed some of you. Um, it's really wonderful to see you here, thank you. Um, I have a question kind of based on what you said in the beginning, Kate, about um, performativity in queerness and how performativity in queerness relates to activism. You know, Zanelli Maholi says specifically for her, you know, understandably, her work so much is about activism, and she says this very much in, in her interview, um, that that's so wholeheartedly a, a part of it. And I know that as, as a young queer person, um, myself and my friends are, you know, at any walk of life, reach a point where, you know, they don't want to be the teacher anymore, or they don't want everything they do to be activism. And I was wondering, um, for any of you, if in that performativity or in work, you know, maybe um, undeniably, no matter what work, queer artists or queer photography is a work of activism, but if for you all as curators, creators, um, there is that line between, I don't know, that breaking point. That makes sense. Interesting question. I guess I can say, you know, um, for most of my career as a curator, I've not dealt with queer themes in the work I've done. So I've done, as you read, shows on industrial photography in Canada and portrait portraits. And actually, the Light My Fire, the portrait show, which happened before the queer shows uh, were confirmed, I had actually seated, uh, they were kind of a thematic permanent collection show. Um, and in it, though none of it was really explicitly sort of said. I seeded images through that I knew that, um, that well, they gave me pleasure as a queer curator and that, that I knew, I figured that occasionally someone would see and be like, oh look, Marie Cassandra's picture of two sailors, you know? Um, is that, how queer is that picture? It's very, it looks very queer to me, but anyway, so I kind of seeded through the show different pictures that kind of for those looking would kind of tip it off, is that activism or not? Um, I like to think it was a little bit of just I'm going to put that there, and it can live there, and people can take it the way they want to take it. And um, so a bit more of a stealth move, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but that's certainly one way. I, I'm kind of busted open now, so anything I do is probably going to get read in a different <laughs> way, uh, sort of professionally speaking. But anyway. Um, I, I, I hear in your question that you're asking about like maybe a certain didactic ele element or quality that people feel some artists or feminists and queers feel compelled to have in their work to kind of, so that the work is activist and so that it, it moves politics forward and it gets people to think and engage. And, um, you know, and some artists can do that successfully, but, um, you know, often, you know, it's art. Like it it's can't, it, it's not a literal translation into, the work and object that you're making and uh, the the ideas and the activism that you believe or that you want to promote. So, I mean, for me, I just let that go and trust my instincts and, and, and myself and the work I want to make that it comes, you know, like from a, a feminist place or, or something like that, you know? And um, I don't need to, to prove it or like have a thesis statement that my work then qualifies to the thesis statement and the thesis is written in advance, you know? So like, I think at a certain point, you know, I always tell artists this, you know, you have to trust yourself 
but um, you know, you can look back and see what those images are doing, you know, and hope that like, that there's some awareness that does create new and different dialogues. But, um, but then I just see as activism in a more literal, active, on the street kind of organizational way. And I don't put that onus on my work personally. I really appreciate what you're saying in terms of I mean, everything, but in terms of looking le looking at the work and seeing what it was doing or how it was it, what it was doing at one time, because I feel like um, that the performative is just like living life, you know, having traveled, living in East Africa in the mid '70s, Europe, you know, causing wreckage, you know, from you know from country to country, back to San Francisco, in a way that the work the work actually in a way functions for me as a way in which to speak back, there's an element of pleasure. Um, but I think often, and maybe this has to do with the burden of representation in terms of let's say this is the, the burden of being different, but I think there is also a pleasure in that. And um, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, I think one doesn't have to necessarily like say, well, I'm an activist. I think just embodying who you are, I think is what is important. I think, I mean, often for me, it wasn't until looking back at the work and thinking, like, to the stuff I did in Ghana, oh, I was actually operating in relationship with my former Shanti partner in a very public space, whether dealing, let's say, at a Shanti funeral or dealing in an environment with the African social elite and being out. And so it wasn't until I got back a year after I, got, a year after I returned from seven years of living in Ghana that I was able to confront something. Prior to that, it was being in the space and not necessarily being an activist in actuality, there's a photograph of, of two men, um, two Ghanaians, dancing. And in fact, my publisher, Greg Miller, he came to visit me, and my next door neighbor, who owned the equivalent of Botanica, had um, Bodega, excuse me, was having a party for a 25-year-old son. And I had never seen, because I could, there, I, was, I wasn't closeted, but I could definitely hide behind a certain professionalism, if you will, or a certain class background. But there you had, let's say, scores of people on the street, and that in a way caused me to even come further out. But I think in a way, I don't think it's an activism. I think it's about maybe living life, you know, and then rubbing up against, let's say, what one encounters. And then afterwards, maybe there are, oh, this is what I was actually thinking. I think some of the work that's in the, um, this, this issue, it was almost like a swan song. Like I had to confront certain things in myself and the culture that maybe I could not do there. I had to actually, while I was there, I had to actually have the experience of living and being present. So I think they're two different modalities for me of like working and living itself. Hi, um, hi my name's Zach Kraven. I'm an artist and curator. Um, you were speaking earlier about queer as being a, a much broader term, referring to sort of anything that rejects a heteronormative, which is something that I've been really interested in lately. Um, for a while, my work was sort of very explicitly about sexuality and gender, but lately I've been really into this idea that many things can be queer. Um, so let's say, you know, David Benjamin Sherry's colored landscapes, we can call those queer landscapes, I think. But then I was wondering, do you think the sort of making queer work that's not about sexuality and gender and oppression um, do you think that's sort of a stance of privilege, like not having to deal with those things, or is it a valid art form that's pushing forward sort of queer identity? It might be interesting to reference Neil and Blake and Lai Render's 96 was an exhibition, because that was, people, people may not be aware that, it, that they talk about that show different, in, the, in a, different, a light. different light. I think it'd be good to get a historical context to talk about that. I mean, one of the things that was really interesting, just to go to your point about in a different light, was that it was in certain ways a kind of queer sensibility show. So there were many artists like, let's say, uh, Robert Morris or Linda Benglis, who in no way are queer mm -hmm. or identified. Well, Morris, but the, 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 I mean, the ad was a pro, I mean, right. you know. So or Linda Benglis' <laughs> dildo ad, or maybe also one of her <laughs> wax sculptures was in it. But, but the way they organized, just very briefly, was they started with, I think it was zero or void, and then it went self, and then it went couple, and then it was, it went all the way, I, then it, I can't remember if it was threesome or foursome, but then it went up to, orgy, maybe group, and then orgy, and then world, and then universe. And so it was meant to be that like queer could not be contained by any, con any one context, and that also queer could exist within these different registers of, of sort of representation and imagining. And I thought that that was, and, but a lot of it had to do, for example, like 
Linda Bengliss's dildo, I mean, it had to do with gender transgression, but not always by people who were living as gender outlaws or as, you know, or as trans or in any way. And I think that that's just really important in terms of what Kate was saying about, look, it's art, and we expect art to be a kind of, to offer some kind of journey for mm -hmm. not only for the viewer, but possibly also for the artist. And, you know, artworks don't have sexual orientations. I mean, to me, queer is about a relation between works and viewers. It's not that queer is embodied for me in an image. You know, it's about sort of what, how the image gets activated. And so I think, yes, a color, I don't know the photographer you're talking about or the it's, artist. It's the, yeah, it's the colored landscape oh, from the slideshow. So maybe I should know him, but um, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know, yes, in this, in this particular slideshow, I'm sure it looks very queer, you know, but put it in a show about landscape and yeah. photography, I'm not sure. I mean, so in other words, context I think matters and also um, relationality, I would say, to use a fancy word. Mm. Uh, the other thing that about just to kind of amplify what you're saying about uh, Nalen Blake's the the essay that he writes for that catalog, he talks about postmodernism really as being the queer experience written brought more broadly for the whole world as as actually as an approach. And I think that 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 <laughs> phrase really struck me when I was doing research for those shows. I think it's um, really actually quite moving. So I, I have a question for the audience that you mentioned postmodernism because I feel like, well, whatever happened to postmodernism, it's so periodized now, it's just like late 80s, early 90s, and I sort of feel like queer has become kind of periodized also to queer nation. And so I just wonder, is queer useful for people here, younger people? Do you identify? I have a lot of students at Stanford and before that at USC who like, they're like, I don't want any of those labels, including queer. They don't see them, they don't identify or organize their politics or their or their sexuality around these terms. Now granted they're in college and a lot of things happen in college, but <laughs> that, aren't, that aren't about permanent identification or may, but maybe, I don't know, I'm just curious. The, I, the, I don't think the, queer is. I'm Kevin Moore, I'm the writer who wrote about David Sherry's work as I'm oh. speaking right now, and I was gonna ask just that question because it seems to me like there's a lot of effort in making this category cohere and it seems to me like as an older generation right. who mostly is sort of wanting to find like a, an archival queer history or something, and I question what's the benefit of that at a moment when um, identity is so unstable, sexuality is so unstable, I mean, it doesn't feel to me like particularly politicized that much anymore, although I agree with you that there's still oppression, there's still, you know, discrimination. Well, there's but also like people getting killed, I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah no. I mean, I think, you know, there's a big difference between certain kinds of images in this issue. It's a very incoherent thing in a way, and that's not um, a, a criticism of aperture, but it's just the state of you know, trying to sort of throw a net on something like, you know, queerness. But, um, I mean, there's such a range of, of work between, between um, social documentary that has a political purpose and work like Kate's, which, which is shuffling the deck and, and mixing things up. And David Sherry's work, I think, is more like that, too. Um, but I think, though, that, I mean, in terms of like a queer aesthetic or whatever, I mean, it's uh, queer is sort of like a child of surrealism, perhaps, and maybe feminism is two, or perhaps they form some kind of weird family that is a general idea of something that disrupts the surface of realism in a certain way. Photography itself does that, I believe. But I think these things all kind of work together to kind of shake the norm. But I think, though, that there's an opposite impulse in this issue and in this room to create a coherent norm, which is, which is in conflict with the idea that, that this will somehow question the status quo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kate, I think you were going to say something. Um, well, I, I mean, I do kind of think that queer doesn't seem as powerful um, a word as, as it once did. It doesn't have that edge or, or cutting sensibility. And, you know, we use words and especially, uh, and then it gets into academia and it's very overused and it kind of loses its punch. So I feel like, you know, we have to keep thinking up new words and uh, like have our ears open and listening to what, what the kids are saying uh, always and kind of um, grasping at words and trying different ones out that maybe are a little bit sharper and that, you know, take the ideas to task a little bit more, which I think queer did at one point. Um, and I was in Sweden recently on a residency and um, everyone was saying norm critical. Now I'm not pushing that. I don't really like that. <laughs> I'm not, I don't, this was the new hot, no, they're, 
Uh, yeah, in Swedish. So what does it sound like in Swedish? Maybe it sounds more clear. So no, it doesn't. I mean, it's, you know, it's like, it's a more, you know, reactive kind of contradictory setup. But anyways, there you go. There's an idea, norm critical. Vincentetti, um, actually. I'm not going to use it, but... <laughs> It sounds like a man's name to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, not to them, but it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's more open and it, you know, it, um, it's interesting, but I think like it's all on us to, you know, keep bringing in new words and see what sticks. In, in his, sorry, in, in, in his article, just a quick point, uh, uh, Vince Aletti, kind of just in passing says, and you know that word pervert, that word pervert hasn't actually been reclaimed. Yeah, an exhibition in the early, yeah. late 90s, 2000, called pervert, and, and that was. Gender yeah. <laughs> Smaller universe, I mean museums, it was wasn't at MoMA, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a couple more questions, we're sort of toward the close of our time, but other quarters that haven't been heard from? Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Tad Beck, an artist, and uh, I recently came across a Jack Pearson quote that I'd love to have you guys respond to, or at least what my memory of the quote is, which may not be what the quote was, um, where he said that uh, photography is essentially homosexual, whereas painting is essentially heterosexual. And uh, I don't know if you guys have heard that before, but it's something I've been thinking about for the past week. It was a part of the press release for the beautiful show. At, um, he has a sh Jack has a show up now um, at Macaron. It's a beautiful show, and I think that was part of the, that, huh. that particular quote was in the um, press release. Yeah. But what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it seems to me that as a photographer, we're kind of responding to the same, whereas a painter might be responding to the other. Um, that's kind of where I've been going with it, where um, the language of a photographer is a language of identification, whereas the language of a painter is one of uh, might be one not of identification, but more of creation. I, mean, I don't mean to be dismissive of Jack Pearson, but it sort of, I mean, it seems a little bit like a provocation to me, and maybe he should explain it. I mean, rather than just <laughs> proposing it. I will but say I that completely agree point. on that point. It's just saying that photography is inherently subversive as a medium that proposes to be something normal, the documentary, but there's always an eruption <coughs> in most images. There's an eruption of fantasy or something else that subverts the sort of initial uh, initial take on the image. That's what. That's one thing he means. But he's also talking about hierarchies between paintings um, and photography too. Which do that too. Was a can painting do the same thing? Yeah. Well, painting can be subversive too. Yeah. Right, I think it's, it's more inherent in photography. <laughs> I would just say, going back to something that Lyle said, I mean, it's pretty hard to make that argument if you're looking at Caravaggio, I, or, or lots of other, or Rosa Bonheur, anyway. But um, maybe, but it's an interesting provocation, perhaps. Um, one more question, is there? Yes. I just wanted to comment on what uh, this gentleman says. I am not myself queer, but I'm an artist, and I do painting, I do sculpture, and I do photography. I find photography lending itself more to femininity and uh, painting more to masculinity. So in terms of being suggestive, I think both of them can be suggestive. But because of the historical factor of photography dealing with the body itself, I think that's where you could find you know, photography being more suggestive and more feminine than painting is. And again, painting having the tradition of being more abstract before photography you know, become abstract in itself. And I think that's why you will find painting being more masculine than photography. OK, I mean, it's, yeah, that's sort of, I think it's always loaded to start gendering artistic, I mean, entire artistic media mediums and histories but 
if it works for your practice, I mean, then, you know. But that's my experience. I'm not saying yeah, it's right, right. definite or absolute. Yeah, so maybe I will take one more question if someone actually has a question about queer photography. Yes. Hi, my name is BJ. I'm a historian and model, kind of. And my question is about if you could just talk a little bit about the word genealogy, which is in the title of the talk. Um, I think it's a very interesting word. I know that it shows up in queer theory a lot and kind of gets batted around. But to me, it has this sort of family connection. Like when I hear genealogy, I think family tree. I'm thinking about the family. And I'm just curious about uh, what your thoughts are on what it means to have a queer genealogy and why that's the word we're using to talk about looking for images from the past, for example. Well, thank you, because I actually want to thank Lyle, because I think you're the only person, including me, who mentioned the word genealogies before you did. And um, I mean, the way I think partially it came about was that I was interested in this notion of intergenerational dialogue, even though we're kind of all, it seems like, maybe on a different generation. I, we both graduated in 88, so we're the same exact age. But don't, I mean, but I'm not going to say what that is. But um, I guess I just did. By saying, but. Um, but I think maybe that's one idea of GDL. You're right, though. It brings with it a whole notion of sort of family and other kinds of origin, um, origins and, and histories. I think that, though, the idea by putting it next to the word queer is that we were going to try to find alternative, as it were, legacies or maybe queer, you know, aunts and uncles rather than grandparents. I don't know, rather than fathers and mothers. Well, I guess when I just answer that by reading a poem sure. from a close friend of mine, um, Essex Hemphill, the great Essex Hemphill, a poet that passed away 20 years ago. And in fact, I'm going to be featuring a photograph of him, part of this archive of work of portraits from 86 and 96, including portraits of, let's say, Nan Golden, Kathy Opie, et cetera. So um, it's from Conditions 86. Um, Essex po poetry, as you probably know, was featured in Marlon Riggs' as Tongues and Tide, very close friends with him, as well as um, Isaac Julian's Looking for Langston. So, um, so sorry, Conditions, um, Essex Hemphill, um, 86. And I think it relates to, for me, genealogy. In America, I place my ring on your cock where it belongs. No horseman bearing terror no soldiers of doom will sweep, swoop in and sweep us apart. They're too busy looting the land to watch us. They don't know we need each other critically. They expect us to call in sick, watch television all night, die by our own hands. They don't know we're becoming powerful. Every time we kiss, we confirm the new world coming. What the rose whispers before blooming, I vow to you. I give you my heart a safe house. I give you promises other than milk, honey, and liberty. I assume you will always be a free man with a dream. In America, place your ring on my cock where it belongs. Long may we live to free this dream. And in a way, it's, it anticipates queer marriage, gay marriage, in a way, and this was written, let's say, in 86, which is, I guess, 20, 25 years ago. So in terms of genealogy, thinking about what I was saying before, in terms of thinking about that legacy, I was very intrigued by Greg Borderwitz, the wonderful artist who did, as part of his um, contribution to the Blues for Smoke exhibition at the Whitney, he curated an, he curated an afternoon of um, gay men's writing from the 80s and 90s, several of which have passed on. And what I was struck by the was the audience. Most of the people of a sold out audience were under 25. So in terms of thinking about their, whether you want to name it queer or what's the other term you from Sweden? <laughs> Whatever you want to call it, there is something emerging where there is an intense passion of the youth looking for these histories, these genealogies to understand. And I think that's a good place to stop off because I think I'm intrigued by the youth who are looking, who are searching and looking, revisiting the, 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 the queer archives, the archives around HIV and AIDS. And I yeah. think there's, it, it, from an academic standpoint, I'm very intrigued and very fascinated by this new generation who did not live during that period, but see it as their duty to return as a way to critique hetero as well as homo, homo normativity, so. And I think just to um, say, that was a very beautiful way to perform queer genealogies by reading that poem. Um, uh, and I think that photography can also, by re, re, not just seeing photography again, but by re-photographing it or activating it in a different context. Or Julia Bryan Wilson actually does a really wonderful yeah. interview with Hal Fisher, who's the uh, creator of this gay semiotics that you're seeing, which is a sort of classic work of, 
a conceptual work from, from the 70s about the gay clone. That's shown in galleries now, right. I mean, which is quite... And I, yeah. and I think yeah. that we can, and I hope, and I think that younger people, I mean, we may actually be the sort of queer archive, or our work may be, we, you know, yeah. a sort of archive for, for people in their 20s now, even though we don't think of ourselves as yeah. a part of the historical past. Get ready. We may be over. <laughs> over yes, for, yeah. You know, but, but still of use, hopefully. And so I think that just, just maybe we could think about queer genealogies not as just this sort of scientific endeavor to uncover a kind of unbroken chain, but actually as this ongoing active, yeah, and to, present, to, yeah. to uh, remember Kate's word, performative yeah. process, whereby different images and poems and words and moments from the past can be, can be revived mm. and reworked. So thank you all for coming. Thank Let's you. Thank the panelists. <laughs> thank you, Richard.